Hi there, I'm Josh, and welcome to our Church on the Move online service. We're so excited you decided to join us, but before we get started, I want to tell you a few ways you can get involved wherever you're watching from. Now you can be a part of the Church on the Move family. If you haven't already, we'd love to connect with you online by having you like our Facebook page or subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can find out everything that's happening at Church on the Move and stay connected to all our different events and ministries that are making a difference right here in Roswell, New Mexico. When you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll get notifications when we go live and when we post new content like sermon series, special events, translations of our service in Spanish, and even videos for Kids on the Move and 180. At Church on the Move, we strongly believe in the power of prayer. And throughout today's service, we have a team of people that'll stand in agreement with you and pray with you during our service online. If you'd rather have someone pray with you privately, you can visit cotmrosel.com slash prayer. One of our staff members will gladly stand in agreement with you. If you live in the Roswell, New Mexico area, we'd love to invite you to our in-person service that happens every Sunday at 9, 1045, 1230, and 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. We'll believe you'll feel right at home and that you'll experience true life change, whether you're in person or right here with us online. So let's get started. Well, hey, good morning, Church on the Move. Who's glad they're in church today? <laughs> well, we're so glad you're here with us. If you're joining us online, it's great to have you as well. We're going to start our service by singing and worshiping our God today. If you're here with us, we have the words right behind us and online. They're down at the bottom. Come on, let's sing and worship today. We bring our praise. You bring revival. We lift our hands, you lift our eyes up. Where your love is found, there will be no fear. God, your kingdom come, your will be done here. Come on, sing these words. On earth as in heaven, Spirit of God.
shadow that has ever overcome your life. There is no rival that could ever stand against your might. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, we've already won. There is no weapon that has ever left a mark on you. There is no army with the power to conquer truth. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, we've already won. Come on, sing these words. Show me. One thing he can do Show me a mountain he can move He's a God of the breakthrough And anything's possible Show me one thing's too hard Show me what he can part He's a God of the breakthrough And anything's possible It's possible That's advancing at the speed of light There is a kingdom Everything is bound to rise God our Redeemer He's faithful to revive He will revive Show me one thing you can do Show me City can move. He's a God of the breakthrough, and anything is possible. Show me one thing is too hard. Show me what as he can part. He's a God of the breakthrough, anything is possible. It's possible. I will turn into praise Shake off despair as I sing out your name A victory dance, I will dance out in faith I will crush this appointment and break every chain All of my fear, I will turn into praise Shake off despair as I sing out your name A victory dance, I will dance out in faith I will crush this appointment and break every chain all of my fear, I will turn into praise. Sing it on the stair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment and break every chain.
For dead beneath the water I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore Should I fall in the space between What remains of me and this reckoning Either way I will bow to the things of this world Cause I know I will never be
Cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy in every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be Praise God. Church family, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. Father, we love you. We're so grateful to be standing in your presence today and worshiping you together. But Father, we know that it was impossible for us to love you without you first loving us. But Father, we're so grateful for your love that nothing else has ever stood in the way or gotten in the way of your love for us, Father, that you continued to provide for us even when we didn't deserve it. You sent your son Jesus to take our place. And Father, we know that people, that there are people in this world that don't know where that love comes from. Father, they haven't experienced in the way that we have to recognize it. And so Lord, we pray that through ministry of churches all over our city, state, and nation, that today they would recognize where your love comes from, Father. That all good things come from you. We pray, Lord, that they would receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior today. And Father, we pray for those pastors who are leading those churches. Father, we're so grateful that you've given us spiritual leaders speaking to our lives, Father God, to help lead us and guide us spiritually. Father God, who are there for us in times of need. Father, so we pray for them right now. We lift them up to you and pray, Lord, that you provide all their needs. Father God, that you'd strengthen them and encourage them, Lord. And Father, we thank you for all those who serve in our government at every level. And Father, we pray for them today. Lord, there's much foolishness that happens in that arena. And we pray, Father God, that those who are lost and have refused to turn their eyes to you will either turn their eyes to you or, Father God, that you would move them out of those places of authority and influence. And, Father, for those who are doing what you've asked them to do, we pray that you would strengthen them, Father God, and help them and encourage them where they are. Increase their influence, Father. And Lord, we pray for all those who are in our military, law enforcement, and first responders. Father, we pray that as they serve others, as they rush to help others in their time of of trouble, Father God, that you would keep them safe and that you would bless them and their families for having that heart towards other people. And we're ready to receive the word today. Father, from our pastor and other ministers on this campus, we know that your word is the most powerful force in the universe. That when your word is spoken, mountains can be moved. And miracles can happen, Father. So we open our hearts and we open our spiritual eyes and ears, Father, that you would move mountains in our lives, Father. Lord, and we receive all the miracles through your word that you share with us today. Father, we thank you and praise you for all of this. In the mighty name of your son, Jesus, and all the people of God said amen. Let's say it one more time together, church family. Oh, for our God is great and greatly to be praised. Glory to your name, Lord. It's great to be here with you today. Before you're seated, if your husband and wife, feel free to greet each other with a hug and a kiss. Otherwise, give five or six people around you a high five, a fist bump. Man, it is so good to see all of you today. Before Pastor Troy comes up to share the message with us, we want to take just a moment and welcome anyone who may be joining us for the first time. We want to welcome all those online. If you're joining us for the first time and this is your first experience with Church on the Move, please reach out to us so that we can connect with you. If you're in the room today and this is your first time here, we just want to say thank you for coming and spending your Sunday with us. Welcome to Church on the Move. We would really like to get to meet you, get to know a little bit about who you are, and we want to bless you by having a gift delivered to your home. How we do that is our ushers have some cards. If we can get that card in your hand, we're going to ask you to simply fill that out and just drop it in the offering bucket when it comes by here in a couple of moments. Then when service is over, there's a place prepared for you out by our coffee shop. Please meet us out there. That's where we'd like to chat with you for just a little bit. So if that's you and you're here for the first time, would you do us a favor? Would you mind lifting your hands so we can welcome you and one of our ushers can hand you that card? Good to see you all. We're so glad that you're here. Nice to have you with us. And if anyone needs a tithe and offering envelope, or if you need a care card for a prayer request or a praise report, go ahead and lift your hand. One of our ushers will be glad to get that for you. We do want our guests to know that we are not placing any expectation on you to give. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 10, This generous God, who supplies abundant seed for the farmer, 
which becomes bread for our meals, is even more extravagant toward you. First, he supplies every need plus more. Then he multiplies the seed as you sow it so that the harvest of your generosity will grow. Man, church family, it amazes me. Every time I read the word, I see how, how big God is, how far and above he does things for us. His love is overwhelming. His peace is overwhelming. His power is overwhelming. His generosity is overwhelming. And he wants our generosity and our love to be overwhelming too. Amen? And so when we tithe and give, that's why he increases us. I was talking to a guy who's, who's tithed and given for years and years and served here faithfully for a really long time. And he, uh, he switched jobs about a year and a half ago in the middle of kind of all the craziness uh, right before it all started going. And so uh, he hadn't built up any vacation time or anything like that. And his parents got ill last year. And uh, this guy's a super hard worker. And his parents got ill last year, and so he didn't have any time to take off to go take care of them. And, and uh, so he went and talked to his boss. You know, they gave him a month off and paid him for every minute that he was gone. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> then check this out. Then his company sends him an $8,000 bonus check after that. Isn't that awesome? I know you're laughing and you're thinking, man, God's huge, right? Let's thank God for how he continues to move in our life. Let's tithe and give and turn him loose to do what he wants to in our lives. As yesterday's get ready to come up and receive the tithes and offerings, if you would, go ahead and direct your attention to the announcements. Here at Church on the Move, we believe safe people serve people. If you'd like to become a member of Church on the Move or serve in a ministry, make sure to sign up for our next Unite class. The next Unite class will start Sunday, April 18th. You can sign up at the Information Center. For more information on anything going on here at the church or to give your tithes online, you can download our church app or visit our website at cotmrazel.com. Now let's give God praise as we welcome up our senior pastor, Troy Smotherman. Praise God. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning to all those here and good morning to all those online. Welcome to church this morning. Man, we're going to have a good time today. Why? Because the Word of God is alive and powerful. Let me say it again. It's alive and powerful. And, and when you, you know, Jesus talks about the seed in the story. He says the seed is the Word. And it's alive and powerful. That seed is always alive and powerful. But then he says this. He says there's four types of soil that it hits. And he said... The difference in the seed being alive and powerful and manifesting in our lives depends solely upon the person that it hits. We know the soil's us. We're the soil that it hits. And so how you receive the word, it says those that receive the word with joy. Those who receive it with joy. Those who receive it and let it become part of them will produce 30, 60, and 100-fold return. What does that mean? So if I receive a word of peace, I not only get enough peace for me, but if I have 30 times, then I can sow it. You know, Pastor Sean shared that scripture. He gives seed to the, he multiplies seed to the sower. So to who, people who give, he'll multiply that seed. So whatever you're giving from the kingdom, he will multiply it so that you can bless others with it. It could be joy, peace, love, kindness. It could be financial. It could be, it could be emotional. It could be deeply spiritual. But he'll multiply that seed for those who receive it. <coughs> and I can tell many of you came ready to receive. And those who didn't come ready, you can, just, you can fix that right now in a second. And just say, you know what, I'm going to open my heart, Lord. Just sow into me. Sow life into me. Amen. Listen, uh, this, the, the name of this new series is called Aftermath. We're going to talk about the things that took place after Jesus' death, after Jesus' resurrection. We're going to tie in some things. We're going to talk about the different visitations people had. We're going to talk about that he was on earth for 40 days and what the number 40 represents, why he was 40 days fasting, why there was 40 days of rain in Noah's day, why Moses was 40 days on the mountain, why Jesus was 40 days on the earth after his resurrection. Man, we're going to talk about all kinds of cool stuff like that. 
And so we're going to talk about the aftermath of what took place. And I'm going to bring it right up in the next couple Sundays all the way up to today. What the aftermath is. What has taken place. And how important it was to us. But first, I'm going to talk about his resurrection again. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 13, it says this. Uh, you know, people are saying there's no resurrection, da 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 in the Bible, those people were called Sadducees. They believed you just died and just disappeared. We have a ton of people that are what would be termed Sadducees. That's what they believe. We just die and we just don't exist anymore. That there's no eternity. And that the dead will not rise. And so they're responding to that. Uh, the Apostle Paul, as he says, For if there is no such thing as a resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, all of our preaching has been for nothing, and your faith is useless. Moreover, if the dead are not raised, that would mean that we are false witnesses who are misrepresenting God. And that would mean that we have preached a lie stating that God raised him from the dead, if in reality he didn't. If the dead aren't raised up, that would mean, you notice the common thing, if, if he's not raised up, then that would mean, that would mean, that would mean, that would mean. That would mean that Christ has not been raised up either. And if Christ is not alive, you're still lost in your sins and your faith is a fantasy. Your faith is a fantasy. It would also mean that those believers in Christ who have passed away have simply perished. Have been simply perished. What is he saying? He's saying that this, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, if that resurrection is not true, then our faith is dead. Why? Because Jesus is dead. And anybody who serves a dead God has dead faith. Buddha, still in the ground. Dead God, dead faith. The Hindu gods of rocks and trees and elephants with six arms and all kinds of crazy stuff, those are man-made objects. They're dead. They have no ears. They have no mouths. They have no tongues. They have no breath. They're dead. Buddha, big fat guy, He's dead. He's a man-made object that is made of, of stone or wood or rock. He has no ears. He has no breath. He's dead. Confucius, dead. Jesus, alive. They're dead. Jesus is alive. So we, that's what I'm saying. If, if he didn't rise from the dead, then our faith is dead. If he didn't rise from the dead, then it's a fantasy. But if he did rise from the dead, then we're serving the living God. So our faith is alive and powerful. If, if he's dead, our faith is dead. If he's alive, our faith is alive. And if, it, if he's alive and our faith is alive, then we're going to see the results of life. That's why I shared those two testimonies last week. What were they a testimony to? Resurrection from the dead. Because that's what God, when he enters our lives, he resurrects our life. We're a living, breathing testimony. I'm a witness. Many of you are witnesses that Jesus is alive because he entered your life and he energized and brought life into your life that you'd never had before. And now you have life and you're getting to a place of abundant life where you're giving life away to others. And, and so, we worship the resurrected Lord. His tomb is empty. Everybody else is in the grave. Ooh, come on now. That's the difference between Christianity and every religion. Every single religion, they worship the dead. We worship the living God. Come on now. And then God put this in my heart. He added, he added this to me this morning. Go with me to Matthew 7, verse 7. He said, so, when, so since we serve the living God that has ears to hear, a tongue to speak, has breath, is alive, then we should be doing this right here. Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and the gift is yours. Seek, and you'll discover. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For every persistent one, everybody say persistent. persistent. Say it three times. Persistent, persistent, persistent. Every persistent one. What does that mean? To be, it means don't quit. Let me say it again. It means don't quit. 
It means those who don't quit. When the apostles, you know, were kind of at their wits' end, Jesus said, you're in need of endurance. They said, what do we need? He said, you need endurance. What does that mean? You need to not quit. He said, only those who don't quit are saved go to heaven. Only those who don't quit. Quit on what? Quit on life? Quit on God? Quit living? Even when others pass away, we don't stop living. Amen? Especially those that pass away, we know they went to heaven. They're not dead. They're alive. They're in heaven waiting on us. Oh, what a happy day that's going to be. Man, oh, man, I've got a daddy and a sister and fa- friends and family, church family that are in heaven already. Man, it's going to be a happy day to see them. There's babies I not, never got to meet that I've done their services. And I can't wait to meet them. I can't wait to see them growing up in heaven. What a better place to grow up than to grow up in heaven, waiting for mommy and daddy to show up. Oh, come on now. Heaven's going to be a happy place. It's going to be awesome. Because it's the home of the living. It's the eternal home of the living. Oh, that that was a sorry hand clap for heaven. I could have said I'm serving tacos right here and got a better hand clap than that, man. See? For every persistent one, those who won't quit will get what he asks for. Every persistent seeker will discover what he longs for. And everyone who knocks persistently will one day find an open door. Oh, man, if you don't quit on the God that's alive, don't quit on the God that's alive. He's alive. He hears. He said, if you pray according to my will, I hear you. If I hear you, then you know I answer you. If you know, I hear you. So when we pray according to his word, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us according to his word, he watches over his word to perform it. He will bring it to pass if we just don't lose heart, if we just don't quit, if we just don't give up. The God of the living will show up in this life and the next. In the next. He's talking about this life. He's talking about this life when he's talking about that. Why? Because we're not going to be asking, seeking, or knocking in heaven. Come on now. It's all, we're in heaven. It's all right there. We're in God's presence 24 hours a day, seven days a week. His manifest presence. Otherwise, we'll be in his actual, physical, spiritual presence all the time. And then he says this, do you, do, do you know of any parent who would give his hungry child who asked for food a plate of rocks instead? Or when asked for a piece of fish, what parent would offer his child a snake instead? If you, imperfect as you are, know how to lovingly take care of your children and give them what's best, how much more? Everybody say, much more. So the persistent get much more. The persistent get much more. How much more? Ready is your heavenly father. What is he? Ready. I've said it before. He, he's ready. He's a giver. He's ready to give. Just waiting for you to ask. Waiting for you to seek. Waiting for you to knock. Wait, ready, waiting on you to hang on. To learn the power of endurance. To learn the power and the strength and the maturity that comes with not being a quitter. People that are extremely mature, they aren't discouraged easy. People that have great endurance, they're not, they have, I know people that aren't even Christians that have some, that are sometimes mentally tougher, physically tougher than those that are Christians. They'll hang on longer. They'll fight harder. We should, we should, the people in the world should not have more endurance than the people of God. We should be the fighters. We should last longer. We should have more patience. We should have more endurance. We should have more strength. Why? Because we got the living God living inside of us in the form of the Holy Spirit, who's greater than this world. He said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We should be the strong ones. We should be the not quitters. We, that's who we are. That's who we're called to be. Some people don't have because they've never asked according to the word, because they've never taken time to study the word. And then when they do ask, some people ask according to the word, they quit easy. They get easily discouraged. They switch their testimony so quickly. They say, well, I asked God for this, and he said in his word, he promised to forgive me of my sins, heal me of my sicknesses. He promised to supercharge my life. And, and yeah, but then one thing goes wrong, man. It's like, oh, man, he don't keep his promises. 
Man, you keep digging up that seed in your heart. You keep on, you, you, you're like a, a weed in the wind. And we've all had these moments, right? Anybody else had these moments that you were strong and then something happened? You're like, oh, I don't know if that's going to happen. We've all had these moments. Me, you, we've all been there. But God said it's like a, a weed in the wind that whatever way the wind's blowing. Yeah, sometimes I feel like yes when I feel good. But when it doesn't look good, I feel like no. He said, we're just like that. We're just blown back and forth. He said, expect to receive nothing from me. Listen, the lukewarm, the dispassionate, the lukewarm, the quitters get nothing from God. But those who will not quit, those who stir themselves up on the inside, those who stand on his word, he said, how much more? How much more will I give you? How much more will I do for you? Just don't quit. Don't give in. He said, how much more ready is your heavenly Father to give wonderful gifts to those who ask him? Wonderful gifts to those who ask him, who won't quit, won't give up, that hang on and hang on and hang on and hang on till it's manifested. And every time they face an obstacle, man, it stretches them. It builds more endurance. Every time that you face something, you don't become weaker, you become stronger. That's why he said, count it all joy. We just sang that song. Count it all joy when you face various trials and tests. Why? Because when you're tested, when you're tried, you build endurance. You build maturity. And when you mature, he said, oh, then you'll be complete and lacking nothing. That's when you'll see God's promises happen one after another, after another, after another. They might not happen in minutes. Some of them might happen in minutes and seconds and months and weeks. But you'll just, it'll be a consistent answered prayer time. If you'll stay persistent, God will be consistent. Amen. That rhymed, and I didn't even think of that till right now. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Go with me to John 10.10. 10. Oh, this is a great verse in the Bible. You want to talk about comparing serving Satan and serving God? You know, and what's sad is I did not know I was serving Satan. Most people don't. Most people don't realize that there's only two kingdoms. And that you're in one or the other. I did not realize because I wasn't in God's kingdom that I was serving the devil's purposes and plans for not only my life, but the people around me. That I was a, I was a negative influence on everyone around me to come over and serve in what the Bible calls the world. The world has a God. It's little G-O-D in the Bible. It's God is Satan himself. It's a, it's, listen, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Satan has a way too. A way of thinking. A way of believing, an attitude about life, an attitude about people, an attitude about yourself. He has a whole nother set of uh, morals. We hear this all the time. Uh, what do they call it? Value, uh, posturing or whatever, or, you know, moral posturing. I can't remember the exact term. You know, millennials have all these crazy cool sounding Terms, you know, instead of just calling stuff what it is, you got to come up with other words to change. But anyway, uh, uh, that's just a pet peeve of mine. But, um, but there's all this, this stuff, you know, that uh, we have morals too. Can I tell you, people a lot of times who are claiming to have morals, it's really immoral. What they're saying is immoral. They're saying they have a morality. Pro, pro, pro choice is a morality. Well, we're all for choices, we're all for freedom but not to kill babies. Who, who wants to be free to do that? that but they call that a moral, a moral issue. That that's moral to believe that. See, Satan has a way, and he'll call it moral too. He'll call it values too. They have family values. Their family value is they don't believe in the family. <coughs> that's, that's their family value. And so we have to understand there's a separation between the two. The Bible says there's two kingdoms, kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light. God's kingdom, Satan's kingdom. Those are the only two kingdoms we have to pick a side. And Jesus describes the two kingdoms right here in John 10.10. 10. He says, a thief has only one thing in mind. Talking about the devil. The devil's a thief. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. That's what the thief wants to do. That's the kingdom of Satan. 
He wants to steal your identity. He wants to steal your value. He wants to steal your self-worth. He wants to destroy your life. He wants to get you on drugs and alcohol and medications. And he wants you to be self-soothing with all kinds of other things that just destroy your body, your mind, your life. He wants to get you focused on all kinds of false and dead gods. So your faith is dead. So your life is dead. Your heart's dead. Your thinking's dead. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's always stealing. And if his mouth is moving, he's lying. If God's mouth is moving, it's the truth. Not a truth, the truth. And Jesus said, I'm going to compare the two. He said, but I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. Or another translation says, I have come to give life in abundance. Abundant, overflowing life. That's what Jesus came to give. That's why the Bible says he's the word of God made manifest. He's the word of God made into a human being. And the word of God is what? Alive and powerful. Alive. This word is alive. And when it becomes alive in us, it starts producing. And if you let it, if you keep watering it and feeding on it, it'll start producing an abundance. That will not just bless you, but every, that's God's kingdom. God's kingdom's always designed that our life, with our relationship with him blesses us to be a blessing to others. That's his whole design. That we have enough love to go around. To be spread out. We have enough kindness and forgiveness in us because he's forgiven us to forgive people and move on. Move forward. Mm, He came to give life. He came to give life. He came to give life in abundant. You You notice how scripture's constantly pointing to abundance? He's the much more. He's the abundant. He's the cup that overflows. I mean, it's always, he's the crop that produces 30, 60, and 100 fold. Man, God's kingdom is full of abundance. When you live the life Jesus came to give, you're going to have an abundance. You're going to have enough love and peace and kindness, all the deeply spiritual things, but you're also going to have enough of everything else to share. Whereas the kingdom of Satan, it's always about stealing and robbing and never enough. The kingdom of God is always about giving and living and more than enough. That's the kingdom of God. And so what does that have to do with it? This has everything to do with what we celebrated last Sunday. Easter, the resurrection of Jesus. It has everything to do with that. Everything to do. The living God produces The living God multiplies. Everything in his kingdom multiplies and produces. And it produces after its own kind. Just like he said in Genesis, that elephants will produce elephants, uh, 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 giraffes will produce giraffes, sharks will produce sharks, trout will produce trout, human beings will produce human beings. Everything will produce after its own kind. Love produces love. Kindness produces kindness. Finances produces finances. Everything produces after its own kind. And in God's hands, it's, it's multiplied. In Satan's hands, it, all of that becomes a negative. All of that becomes a takeaway that people are looking to take from each other instead of to give to each other. That's the aftermath. That's the title of this series. That's the aftermath of Jesus' life and resurrection. This is the aftermath. Go with me to Matthew. Chapter 27, you're right there in John. First book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 27, verse 50, says this. Jesus passionately cried out, look, or took his last breath and gave up his spirit. Matthew 27, 50. Verse 51. At the moment, the veil in the Holy of Holies was torn in two from top to bottom. So, Jesus dies His spirit descends to the center of the earth where there's paradise and and hell, a place called Hades, the dwelling place of the the spirits. And and there's paradise where where all the people who believed in God went, and there's hell where people who don't believe in God always go. He went down and testified to all of them, I I am the Savior. 
And as he descended, an angel of the Lord cut the veil. The veil, this is a physical veil that was in the temple of the Jews that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. He cut it in two and ripped it apart. What did that veil represent? Well, it represented sin. And it represented that when Adam and Eve sinned and Adam sinned, that there was a separation between God and man. And the only time a human being could go on the other side of that veil was the day of atonement where they, where they slaughtered the, the animals and he would take the blood and some, th- some people believe that he would be supernaturally transported on the other side of that veil because it had no seams. That veil had no seams. It was seamless. And so he would, and so, and then he would go and sprinkle the blood on the Ark of the Covenant where the two cherubim angels would sit. Two cherubim, remember, two cherubim angels would sit, and they had their wings spread over the ark, and he would sprinkle blood. And, and the Bible teaches that, that a lot of times when they'd come into the temple, that the Shekinah glory of God, which would appear as a cloud, the cloud that led the, the Jews during the day that would protect them from the sun and lead them, and the cloud that entered the temple when they dedicated the temple, I mean, when Solomon dedicated the temple, anytime that cloud would appear, and that that cloud would appear, and not even the high priest could look upon the, whole, the mercy seat. Even when he was sprinkled the blood, he couldn't see it. Why? Because even though the high priest was, had the veil, could go through the veil, the veil that separated God and man, and he could only do it one time a year. One time a year he did it. At the risk of his own life if he didn't do it right. That even he, even this person, could not look at the face of God receiving the God-given mercy. Could not look at him. Could not look at him. So even he was veiled with the cloud. So when that veil was ripped, what it represented was is that no longer did one person have to go that even that person was restricted from seeing God face to face. Now all people who believed in God, in the living Christ, Jesus, could boldly go into the presence of God and see him face to face. To face. Why? Because the blood of bulls and goats couldn't satisfy God's forgiveness for sin, but the blood of his holy son could. And that, that ark represented Jesus. Jesus is now the mercy seat physically. The blood that was poured out of him on his crucifixion, it was being poured. He is the literal mercy seat now. Not the Ark of the Covenant. He is. So as they were tearing him apart and his blood was shed, what they were really doing was is pouring the blood out of mercy towards us. Forgiveness. And because his blood speaks of mercy and forgiveness, it grants us direct, direct access. That's why the Bible says, come boldly into the throne of grace. Come boldly to your, he calls God Father now. Father. That word father was very rarely used in the Old Testament. Most people did not use that word. They said God. He is God. But he's also, it's more personal now. He's not only God. He's God our father. We're not just his servants now. We're his children. There's no wall between us. The wall of sin that separates us has been torn apart. And we can walk right in boldly with confidence and ask and seek and knock. Boldly, confidently go before our Father. And He'll respond like a father. I pray in Psalms, David would pray. One of the few that called God Father. He'd say, respond to me like a father. I pray those things out. God, respond to me like a father would, like I would with my children. And how much more you are than I am. How much better a father you are than any of us could ever be. That's how he responds. And that's what took place. Then this took place. The earth shook violently. The Bible says in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel, Daniel, all the prophets prophesied that rocks would break open. That the earth would literally break open. And this is, this is the fulfillment of the prophecy. These rocks split open and apart. And graves were opened. Then many of the holy ones who had died were brought back to life and came out of their graves. And after Jesus' resurrection, they were plainly seen by many people walking in Jerusalem. Man, it is crazy that this happened. 
that after Jesus' resurrection, they saw these people. There was so much life in Jesus' resurrection that when he came out of that tomb, a bunch of other people came with him. Why? Because it's life in abundant life. And they were walking around the city. You know, there's a movie that the guy says, I see dead people, or what some kid says, I see dead people. I can't remember that movie. But, I mean, they, they're walking around literally going, I see dead people. Wow, that was, that's, that's old Cousin Harry. He died, to, you know, that's old Grandma and Grandpa. I mean, that's Abraham. I don't know who all rose, but they all rose. And he didn't even mention their names. This is what's crazy to me. I'm like, how do you see that and know that and not even mention the name? I want to know who was raised. But listen, that's so insignificant, he just mentions they did it. Why? Because the significant thing is Jesus did it. The only name mentioned is his name. Because it's not possible for anybody else to be raised from the dead except Jesus comes first. He has to. Everything else is insignificant compared to that. But you'd at least think he'd list a couple names. You know. Let us know. I always said when I get to heaven, if it's important at all, I want to see, like, videotape. I say videotape. <laughs> what would it be called in today's world? Not videotape. I don't even know what it's called. You guys don't even know what it's called. <laughs> Whatever we watch on now, computerized digital images, I don't know what it is, but, huh? Stream it. Stream it. Okay, stream it. I know in the back of one of these high-tech places, there's a guy with a bunch of reel-to-reel tape. You know, he's just thinking you're streaming. You know, right? But anyway, you don't even, some of you don't even know what a reel-to-reel is. Uh, I don't even want to take time to describe it to you. you want to get, but anyway, I want to look and say, I want to see some stuff that happened that was crazy. Like, I'm going to say, well, I want to know what that looked like. These people just walking around, pulling off their grave clothes, and they're starting to walk around the streets, and there's a bunch of them. You know what they're all telling everybody? Hey, Jesus, Jesus is alive. He's the Lord. He's the Savior. He's the Messiah, and I'm a living testimony. I'm a living testimony. They got to live a whole nother life. They lived a whole nother life and died again. They lived a whole nother life. They lived in Jerusalem. Then you wonder why the church in Jerusalem blew up. Because these people are walking around testifying about who? The living God, Jesus, the living Christ. And they're alive because of it. And guess what? We're alive. Many of us are alive because of it, physically, but especially spiritually. And we're supposed to be the ones that were dead, walking around telling everybody how we're alive. We're the ones that should be, we're the ones walking around the city. I was once dead, but now I'm alive. We're the ones testifying now. Now, when the Roman military officer and his soldiers witnessed what is happening and felt the powerful earthquake, they were extremely terrified. They said, there's no doubt this man was the son of God. The only thing they got wrong is they said was. You think they say is. This man is the son of God. Not was, not past tense. Is. It's always future tense. He was, he is, and always will be the son of God. But even they got saved. The Roman soldiers who tortured him, crucified him, God, God gave them a revelation of who Jesus was in this moment. Hard to deny at this time. Hard to deny. But all of this is taking place. All of this is happening to fulfill prophecy and to testify to us. Man, now, I'm going to get to some other things that happen. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verse, verse 1. It says this, Now the serpent was more subtle and crafty than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made. And he, Satan, said to the woman, Can it really be that God has said you shall not eat from every tree of the garden remember the garden remember the garden and the woman said to the serpent we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden except the fruit from the tree which is in the middle of the garden 
God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Next one. But the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. Now, we can stop right there for a second. Now, I want you to catch this. A couple things happened in the garden. One, in a garden, Satan appeared and told the first lie to Eve. In a garden, Adam's standing right there, spiritually passive. Let me say that again, men. Adam's standing right there, spiritually passive. The Bible says that when she ate, said she gave some to Adam who was standing right there. Listening to this, watching this unfold, it was spiritually passive. Men, you cannot be spiritually passive. You get spiritually passive, all kinds of crazy stuff's going to happen in your household and in the lives of your wives and your children. You cannot be spiritually passive. Adam was spiritually passive. He did nothing but eat. She offered it to him. He grabbed it. He wasn't deceived. He knew, he knew the conversation that took place was not right. He knew that they would surely die. He knew the word of God. He was the one that it was given to, not Eve. Eve got it secondhand from Adam. He didn't correct it. He didn't fight for her. He didn't fight against it. Satan. He didn't stand for her or his future generations. He disobeyed and rebelled against God. He was not deceived. He just chose Eve over God. He chose a relationship over over God. He chose not fighting over God. He chose passivity over God. When you're spiritually passive, the Bible says, if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out. He was spiritually passive. He should have rose up and said, he had all authority over that serpent. Serpent, get out of here. Eve, that was a lie. Let me tell you the truth. Let's get this right. Let's not eat. Let's not do this. And it would, everything would have been hunky-dory. But he didn't. Men, when you're spiritually passive and you're over a household, or ladies, or uh, if you're over a household and you're single, you're, don't be spiritually passive. You get spiritually passive, Satan will take advantage every single time. In a garden. In a garden this happened. In a garden, a lot of things happen. Go with me to John, the book of John. We're going to look at several scriptures in John. The book of John, verse 18, or chapter 18, verse 1. John 18, 1. We'll read it together up here. After Jesus finished this prayer, he left with his disciples and went across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden. What is this part? This is where Jesus falls on his face in a garden. What does he say to God? Instead of disobeying God, the Bible says through one man's disobedience, all men fell, but through one man's obedience, all men live. So, Adam lost all authority to this earth in a garden. All men fell in a garden. It's just like God to send Jesus back to a garden where he says, not my will, Lord, but your will. Whereas disobedience in Adam in a garden caused men to fall, obedience in a garden offers men and women, all people, eternal life. I like how God thinks. I, I said I like how God thinks. In sports, if a team beat us on our field or beat us bad on their field, I liked going back to that field and whooping their tail. Taking back what we had lost. Taking back defeat with victory. Come on now. I like how God thinks. He calls himself a victorious warrior. That's what he says about himself. You know what that tells me? He's a competitor. And he never loses. So they lost it in the garden. He comes Jesus right back. Fully man and fully God. Goes to a garden and says, Not my will, but your will be done. And wins back. Starts right in that moment, winning back what we had lost. Oh, then check this out. John 19, you're there in John 18. Go with me to John 19, verse 41. You can put that one up on the screen too, if you will, please. John 19, verse 41. Near the place where Jesus was crucified was a... And in the... There was a new tomb where no one had yet been laid to rest. Where did Jesus resurrect from? In a garden. 
He, bows, he obeyed in the garden, resurrected from the dead in the garden, said, I'm the king of kings and lord of lords in the garden. Says, I was once dead, but I'm alive in a garden. Said, Adam lost it all, but I'm here to take it all back in a garden. Our God goes right back to that spot. It says, I'm claiming this all back. Right on. I wouldn't be shocked if this is the exact same spot. I just, God just think, I'm going to the exact same location where they lost it, and I'm taking it all back. That's the aftermath. God restoring. This is incredible stuff, how God operates, how God thinks, how easily we can miss things like this. You're right there in John 19, John 20. Oh, John 20. In verse 11, after Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus and Joanna, go to the tomb and see it empty. We're going to go back to that moment in a minute. But I'm going to fast forward. After they do all that and the disciples come and see it empty, they all walk away. But Mary Magdalene runs back to the tomb and begins to weep. It says in verse 11, Mary arrived back at the tomb broken and sobbing. She stopped to peer inside and through her tears she saw the two angels. Now, Let's skip forward. Remember the two angels, but let's skip forward. Uh, then she turned around to leave, and there was Jesus standing in front of her, but she didn't realize that it was him. He said to her, Dear woman, why are you crying? Why are you looking? What are you, who are you looking for? Mary answered, thinking he was only the gardener. Sir, if you have taken his body somewhere else, tell me, and I will go in, and right in the middle of that end, Jesus interrupted her and said, Mary, said her name. Turning to face him, she said, Rabboni, my teacher. Jesus cautioned her, Mary, don't hold on to me now, for I haven't yet ascended to God, my Father. And he's not only my Father and God, but now he's your Father and your God. Now go to my brothers and tell them what I've told you, that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Where did this take place? In the garden. Where was Eve first lied to? Garden, where did a woman, the first person to see Jesus resurrected was Mary Magdalene. A woman who was lost, a prostitute who was lost in sin, now saved, now purified by the love of God, forgiven, right with God. She shows up. A woman that had walked in deception of herself, value and worth, what was right and wrong her whole life, now is living in the truth. And she's the first one to hear the truth. Eve was the first one to believe a lie. Now Mary's the first one to believe the truth. Why? And not only does she, she it could have been enough. She saw Jesus. She knows he's alive. She can testify to that, but that's not, Jesus didn't stop there. Ladies, Jesus didn't stop there. He's redeeming all the womankind right here. He's redeeming all women right here. Because women, up to this point, and in a lot of Arab countries now, women cannot testify in court. If a woman is raped in the Arab world, three men have to testify they witnessed it. Otherwise, there'll be no trial. Today, 2021. Back then, women could not testify in court. And if they did, their testimony was considered minor. A man had to witness it, a man had to see it, a man had to testify. Why? Because of Genesis chapter 3 that a woman was deceived by Satan. Okay? So their testimony wasn't valuable at any level. In the ancient world, any level. But now Jesus comes back to a garden, talks to Mary Magdalene and says, here I am, Mary, it's me. And she sees the truth, because he's the way, the truth, and the life. She knows the truth first. She believed the first lie. She believed the first truth. But not only that, he gives her a message. He says, speak my word to them, to the men. So she goes and not only carries her testimony, but she carries the word. And what is God doing here? He's redeeming women that their testimony is just as valuable and their speaking the word is valuable as well. He redeemed it all, ladies. He said it right. 
The first thing to go wrong in the garden is the first thing he sets right. He said, I'm redeeming you ladies. Come on now. That's how good God is. That's how awesome he is. I, I just, I don't know, man. God must be competitive because he's just like smacking Satan. Man, just tell me when you've had enough. Because I'm doing it all. I'm setting everything right. Everything right. He's restoring and setting and establishing. Remember I told you to remember the two angels. In the garden, when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, God sent angels to guard the entrance. It said the east entrance. But that word east could reference every entrance. I don't know how many entrances there were to the garden. Might have just been one. But he sent angels to guard it. And they had to stop people from eating from the tree of life and living in sin forever. That's why they did it. That's why God did it. And they had to enforce the separation. They had to enforce the separation between God and man. They had to enforce it. That's why the cherubim were over the ark. They were enforcing the cherubim angels, the great cherubim angels, which are massive. Most people have described them as being 10, 12, 20 feet tall, massive wingspans that would span this whole stage. Pretty awesome. It's going to be cool to see those. And they, there's two of them in, in gold, solid gold, over the Ark of the Covenant. Spread their wings over the Ark. Cherubim are six wings angels. And so this, this, these angels are assigned to the garden to keep men separated from the tree of life so they don't live in sin forever. And then here was, here's what God does. In that place where there was a rock and a veil that represented the separation between God and man, they rip the veil in two and roll the walk, rock, rock away. And they're the ones that appear to the ladies and say, He's not here. He's not here. I can only imagine if those same angels are the ones that guarded Eden, got to be the same angels that got to come and tell the ladies, he's not here. The ones that kept enforcement of the separation between God and man with the veil and with the rock are now the ones that get to proclaim there is no more separation. Everything's set right. God is a God that sets things. If you'll wait on him, if you'll be persistent, if you'll ask and keep asking, seek and keep seeking, knock and keep knocking, and not give up and not quit, he'll set it right. He'll set it right. What Satan has stolen, he'll set right. He did it then. He does it now. He'll do it forever. He'll set it right. We're not even done talking about what he did, the aftermath. Woo, come on, man. We haven't even gotten to where he sent the fire of the Holy Spirit and started the church. They were on fire. Mm, I hear a slight crackle. Maybe a few coals. But God wants us on fire. Listen, every eye closed. Everybody watching online, if you just pause for a moment in what you're doing, pay attention just for a second. As, along with everybody here, consider your life. Which direction are you going? Are you part of the robbing, stealing, destroying bunch? Or are you part of the life and abundant life bunch? There's only two sides in this. There's only two sides. There's not a third, there's not a humankind side. There's, not a no, there's no other side. It's Satan's side or God's side, and you get to choose. You get to choose. You can, you can ask, well, how did I get on Satan's side? We were born into it. We were born into Satan's side. That's why we have to be born again on the inside. Our spirit, our heart has to be brought to life by the power of the same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead brings us back to life. The power of the Holy Spirit and comes alive inside of us and resurrects our lives. But that only happens when you recognize Jesus as the Lord. I see so many things. Gosh, just 
So many people living kind of lukewarm lives. People that claim to know God. Then I see so many people not living for God at all. And sometimes people just don't get it. Even people in the church don't get it. He's got to be the Lord. Lord means master. Lord means ruler, leader, king, high priest. He's got to be the Lord. He's got to be the head of your life. You're following him. So many people want Jesus to follow them. They want to be the, the boss of their life, not him. Can I tell you, he won't do that. He won't just follow you. He'll love you. He'll care for you. He'll be present, but he's not following you anywhere. We don't know how to lead to life and life abundantly, but he does. But here's the thing about God is he won't make you. He's not a control freak. He's not a two-bit dictator. I say that all the time because I grew up thinking that. Religion will teach you that, that he wants to control you. No, he wants a relationship with you, but he's got to be the leader of it. Someone leads in every relationship. And he's the Lord, and he wants to lead because he knows where he's going. He sees the past, the, future, the present, and the future all at once. That's the one we want to follow, the one that already sees out in front of us. Don't want to follow people that only see from behind. We want to follow people that have foresight, not just hindsight. We want to follow Jesus. So if you're here today and you've never, you've never made that decision, He won't make you. He offers it to you. He offers his, his life, His resurrection. He offers you the Holy Spirit. He offers you His lordship, His leadership, His kingdom, citizenry in the kingdom of heaven. He offers you to adopt you into the family of God and call you son or daughter, brother, sister. But he won't make you. He's not like that. This is not an invitation to some religious beliefs. This is an invitation to a relationship with the living God. Everything else is just a bunch of superficial religion because it's dead. It can only be superficial because it's dead. This is a living, deepest part of your heart, life, relationship. And he'll show you how that works. And if you'll give your heart to him, he'll deal with all the habits and stuff. Just come as you are, but he won't leave you as you are. He won't. He'll change you for the good. And he won't make you change. It'll be your choice. Your choices. He doesn't want to take over and just possess you. That's what Satan wants to do. No, he wants a relationship with you. Where you chose him as the leader. You chose him as the Lord. You chose him as God of your life. So if you've never done that and you want to do that, we want to pray with you right now. Not... Not tomorrow. We're not putting it off. Today's the day of salvation. Today's your moment. This is your moment right here. I want to pray with you right now. Or you've prayed before and you've walked away from him and you need to be restored. Come home today. Let's pray. Let's pray today. God's not a God of a second chance. He's a God of another chance. Let's pray today. Be persistent. Fight back. Stand back up. So whether the first time or the next time you want to pray, I'm going to ask you to do two things. The first one is I'm going to ask you to raise your hand on the count of three. The second one is we're all just going to stand up and pray together. No strings attached to either one of them. But you need to publicly acknowledge, I need to get right with God. So on the count of three, just raise your hand up high and put it down quickly. Just raise it up, put it down. One, two, three. I'm going to pray and get right with God. Put your hand up. All over the room. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All over the room. Thank you. Wow, that's awesome. All right, stand to your feet. Thank you. I see those hands. Thank you. Stand up. Let's pray with them. Uh, those that raise your hand just mean business with God today. He'll do his part if you'll just be sincere and honest with him. So say this. Say, God, I believe you're God and God alone. There are no other gods but you. In an order to satisfy your love for us. You send Jesus. 
to rescue us, to save us from ourselves and each other. Thank you. And he died on a cross for my sins. You raised him from the dead, and he is alive. And because I believe that, I ask you, by the living blood of Jesus, to forgive me of all my sins. And I say to you, Jesus, you are the Lord Jesus Christ of my life. I gladly, voluntarily, give you all my life. And I thank you, you give me the life-giving Holy Spirit that lives inside of me, guides me, teaches me. You give me the life-giving Word and Spirit to teach me how to live the life in the abundant life. You came to give me in this life, in the next. Thank you in Jesus' name. So be it. Amen. Come on, let's thank God for how good he is. He's so good. Good, 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 good. If you lifted your hand and prayed today, we have some people who would love to give you some books that are going to help you take your next step in your relationship with Jesus. If you're online, please uh, reach out and let us know some information where we can send you these same things. But if you're here today, just let them know as you're leaving, there'll be someone at every door that you prayed, and we're going to give those to you. Also, if anybody needs a Bible, please let us know. We'd love to give you a Bible. And for anyone who needs prayer, our prayer team will be down here following service. Church on the move. Have an awesome rest of your week. God bless you. You are dismissed.